Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. And I'm thankful for those that were able to be out and to be here. <clears throat> thankful for the folks that are listening from the parking lot this morning. Still got a very lengthy prayer list out front there. We've added some other names this morning. That people that are battling with COVID. Uh, we're thankful to get to report this morning that Brother Donald got home from the hospital yesterday. Uh, now he's still got oxygen and all that sort of thing, of course, but uh, with all, all the heart trouble and all that he's had in the past, uh, not that it's good when anybody gets COVID, but it certainly certainly gave us all pause for concern and, and, and we're thankful that, that he was well enough to get to come back home and uh, trust that he continues to improve as well as the multitude of others that are uh, not well for that and various other reasons. Uh, it seems like that COVID is all we can talk about anymore, but there, there are still other illnesses in the world. There are still other, other things to be uh, prayerful about and concerned over, and, and uh, we just are thankful that we know that God knows all of those needs and that, that he sees to those needs according to his will and purpose. We invite you to turn with us this morning to the ninth chapter of Isaiah. I'll begin reading with the fifth verse. And my time beast just decided to act it up, so we're going to go to plan B. always playing me. At least when it comes to keeping time. The ninth chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. I'm going to begin reading at the fifth verse. And he records these words for every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Certainly familiar scripture. If you don't hear it any other time, and of course you're apt to hear it from me from time to time on occasions other than, than what we observe as Christmas, because it's a story that's true 365 days a year, and, and we need to know it and remember it and dwell upon it. We don't often think of the birth of Christ and battle going hand in hand to do it. And that's one reason I wanted to read that fifth verse. I want us to understand that Jesus was born into this world during a time of great upheaval, a time of deceitfulness, a time when men were seeking their own devices and looking to elevate themselves and, and desiring preeminence among their fellows and, and pretty much willing to do whatever they had to do to get that. And here we are some better than 2,000 years later and 
that same thing is still true. And the battle of the warrior is confused with noise. There's always great chaos. There's always destruction. There's always trouble. But there was something that was promised us, something that has been granted unto us, something that has given unto us that we are told shall burn these things away. Now, I don't believe for a minute that that means that, that it's going to quit happening in the world because it hasn't ever quit happening in the world. And as I've said to you before, I know that, you know, we, we talk about making the world a better place and what we can do to make the world a better place. And, and I'm not telling you that we shouldn't strive to make the world a better place. But I am going to tell you this, that if the world ever actually becomes... Now, we may be able to, to, to have, do something in our little corner for a season. But if the world in general ever becomes a better place, then the Word of God's not true. Because the word of God says with the world it shall wax worse and worse. And I'm perfectly happy to let God be true and every man a liar. Now, I didn't, like I said, I'm not saying that we should not strive to help our fellow man. I'm not saying that we should not do all that's in our power to feed the sick and, and, and to feed the hungry and to clothe the destitute and to help the sick and do everything that we can around us to help those around us. But understand, child of God, that according to the Word of God, the world is not going to become a better place. But we had here by prophecy and later we'll see by being declared by the very angels of God that God was going to send one that for his people would burn this up. It would not, it would not touch us. It would not harm us. It would not cause us to lose our faith or to lose our sight or to lose our view of God our Savior. For unto us God's immutable promise. God's sure and steadfast word unto us. And you say, well, wait a minute. Isaiah was a Jew. And he was writing to the Jews. And the Gentiles weren't any part of this, so how does, how does this prophecy apply to us? Well, if we go and, and look at the New Testament and what it teaches us about being a Jew, it tells us that those are not Jews that are Jews outwardly, but <clears throat> Jews inwardly, that are born of the Spirit of God, if you will, and have been drawn into and brought into God's covenant. So I ask you this morning, child of God, do you find yourself to be having been brought into God's covenant? Do you feel like that you are recipients of God's promises of love and mercy and grace and salvation? Well, if you are, then I'm going to tell you by the authority of God's Word that you are a Jew inwardly. And if you are, this prophecy was for you much as it was for them. Unto us a child is born. Now, Isaiah was looking ahead a long time. We're looking behind if you want to talk about the actual literal event. But like I said last week, there, there, there are God's children in this world every day that this becomes real too by their experience. It's not made real by, because it wasn't real before. God's word is true. But you know what? There, there were things in God's word until, they, they, until he caused them to be a part of my experience. They weren't real to me. Were they? I, I didn't understand them. I couldn't conceive them. I couldn't hold on to them as mine. Are you thankful this morning, child of God, that you can hold on to God's word and claim it as yours because God has given it to you unto us? A child is born. We all know how happy a birth in the family makes us, don't we? 
My daughter has been born some of the most thrilling moments of my life. And then my granddaughters came along. And then we got that great grandson. <clears throat> it's a wonderful thing. It's a wondrous thing to us for a child to be born. But how wondrous is it indeed when we realize that that child is verily man and verily God. Emmanuel. God with us. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Now we all understand, you know, son from, from the standpoint of being, being a male heir, so to speak, or being born, born uh, of the male gender. But in this case, son also meant the hope of building up the house or the one who was going to build up the house, the one who would build up the name. We were given a son who is building up, who, was, who built up then, is building up now and will forever build up the name of the family of God until us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. There are republics in the world like we're a part of where we elect our officials. There are still places that have kings and queens, places that have dictators. There are all kinds of rulers in the world. The child of God, make no mistake, the government, the authority is still on the shoulders of this child that was given to us, this son that was born unto us, this gift of promise from Almighty God. The government shall be upon His shoulder, and I don't see anywhere in God's Word where it ever departed from Him. Amen. And His name shall be called Wonderful. You say, well, everybody don't think He's wonderful. No, everybody didn't think He was wonderful then either. Remember, unto us, a child is born. And unto us a son is given. And to those who are of the understanding and the faith by the grace of God that this was a promise unto us, to us his name is wonderful, amazing, miraculous, powerful. His name shall be called Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. What a wonderful name. Counselor. You know, there have been a lot of times in my almost 66 years that I didn't have a clue about what I ought to be doing or how I ought to be going about it. And there were times when I sought out advice from my friends. A time or two when I went to a lawyer, <laughs> talked to other ministers, talked to my brothers and sisters in the church, Sometimes I talk to two or three different people about the same problem and I get two or three different answers for the solution. And every one of them meant well and gave their thoughts in love. But I have always found that there is one counselor that I have that whenever by God's grace through faith I am able to bow myself before his throne and seek him for his guidance and his leadership that the answer is always yea and amen that it never varies that it's always true that it's always good you say well I don't believe God talks to people well you won't until he speaks to you 
And I'm not telling you it's going to be a voice like you hear me. I'm going to tell you this. It can be. It can be. Might not anybody else hear it, but you can hear it as an audible voice. And sometimes it's just that sweet presence, that sweet leadership in your heart and in your mind. As, as Isaiah says in another place, it's that voice that whispers, but that's behind you whispering, turn here and go there. Counselor, the mighty God. Can you think about this for a minute? Unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And his name shall be called the mighty God. I don't know about you. But the thought that the God of heaven and earth would in the person of Jesus Christ take upon himself the form of man and humble himself to be born into this world of a virgin and wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid in a manger. To grow up in this world of sin as an example for us because I tell you again, I told you this before, I probably told you this last Sunday. He was a Savior when he was in that manger. He didn't have to grow up to become a Savior. He was born a Savior. But he stayed here for 33 and a half years. So it could be said truly of him that he was tempted in all points, even as you are tempted, that you are never faced with anything that you do, that your high priest, Jesus Christ, does not understand. You are never faced with anything that he cannot feel, your infirmity. And he does so with love and compassion. Unto us a son is given, and he shall be called the mighty God, the everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Now I want to get to this seventh verse because, and again, I, you know, we, we, we sometimes we look around, and particularly in this country right now, so many of us, we see our congregations dwindling. We're getting older. And we all realize that the Lord didn't send us some younger folks. That the day will come as it has in many places where that there won't be anybody left to worship in this spot. I pray that it be God's will that that never be our lot. That generations after I'm gone that there will be somebody here praising Him in spirit and in truth. So I don't want you to think that I'm giving up hope I'm not. But I want you to know this too because there are people in the world that are going to tell you that the church is dying. I'm going to tell you something. The church is not dying. Our congregations might be dwindling, but the church is not dying. God's church in the world is not dying because God's promise that I'm reading from you here goes on and says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David. Now that phrase upon the throne of David is important because it signifies his kingdom here in this world. Didn't you say we'd hang on? Didn't you say the church would hold on by its fingernails till the end comes? Of the increase of his government. Remember, the government shall be upon his shoulders. And of the increase. You understand maintaining is not increasing. Increasing means something's getting bigger. It means something's growing. Of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment. Now, 
That word judgment, you know, most times we, we, we read that word judgment and we're filled with dread, aren't we? Because most times in this world, you know, when, when somebody talks about judgment, they're talking about, they're talking about something bad coming down on you. But judgment simply means the rendering of a decision. It's not necessarily bad. Now, don't misunderstand me. God still is in control, and his judgment is still true and still righteous, and I'm not going to stand here and tell you like some would. Some think that because we are under grace that, that God don't care how we behave ourselves. I'm going to tell you something. I, might, I, I am by his mercy. I am under the grace of his covenant. And I thank him for that every day. And I'm thankful that I don't fear that I ever want to do anything that's going to cause me to fall out of that situation. But that doesn't mean that I'm not ever going to do anything that's going to cause me to feel his chastening. And that's judgment. No, it's not eternal condemnation. When I was a child, I, I, I can truth, I never worried about my daddy beating me to death. But there was an occasion or two in my life that I sure did dread that switch. And I knew it was coming. And I knew it was coming, not because of something he did, but because of something I did. Now that didn't make me like it any better. But see, that was judgment. And then later when he'd come and gather me up in his arms and tell me, I love you. You just can't behave that way. See, that was judgment too. And that was a judgment of joy and of peace and of consolation. The judgment. To establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth, even forever. And do you know why I am absolutely positive that this is undeniably true? Because he didn't leave it up to anybody else. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God didn't leave it up to us. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful? Have you, have you not ever in your life had the experience? I, I, I feel sure you have. You know, there's been a few times that I've been so insistent on doing things my way that my Heavenly Father said, okay, do it your way. I can tell you right now, it's never pretty. <clears throat> it never worked out well when I did it my way. But in his judgment and his justice, when I could turn and seek his face, he who was by prophecy given unto us as a child, as a son, as a builder of the family of God. I am thankful that it is the zeal of the Lord of hosts that performs this because see I know it's being done I know it's being carried out I know it's being carried out every day because God didn't leave it up to somebody else to do it he said his zeal would perform it now turn with me for just a few moments to Luke chapter 2 The story that you've heard read hundreds and hundreds of times in your life. But you see, my prayer to God is that He would make it new to you again. And that's, again, the wonder of the God that we serve. He can take things that we've known and understood for years and make it like it was the first time we ever heard it. First time we ever understood. What joy, what consolation. As I've said before, most of you didn't know anything about me. No, I like to read. I'm, I'm one of these people that if there's a cereal box sitting on the table, I'll read the cereal box. <laughs> I got all kinds of books at the house. I like to read. One of my
my one of my favorite stories from the time I was in middle school was the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I got the whole set still at the house. I've read it through, I don't know, several times. But you know something? From the first time that I read it through, every time I've read it through since, there's never been anything different in that. It's always told me the same story with the same characters. I knew what was coming. I knew what the outcome was going to be. And it was never different. Nothing ever changed. I have, I have never read anything new in those books, ever. And yet, by God's grace, I can pick up his word. I can't tell you how many times I've read it. But I can pick up his word, and when his spirit is upon me, it's fresh all over again. It's new all over again. And I still find myself reading things that I've never read before. I probably shared with you the experience that, that I had. Well, I've had it more one time before. One time in particular stands out to me when I was living in Indiana. And one Sunday, I, I, I couldn't tell you what the text was now. But what I do know is that in the middle of that text, God opened something to me that was just amazing to my soul. And when I came down out of the stand and we were greeting folks and we were getting ready to leave, and this one brother come up and hugged me, he said, he said, Brother Marshall, he said, I've never seen that before. And I hugged him back and I said, Brother Bud, neither have I. <laughs> you see, it was just as wonderful to me. And it still is. As it was to him. And as it is to you. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. You see, the, the scripture is very careful with that word, his espoused wife. He still had not made her his wife in the sense of having consummated that union. Because she was already great with the child from the Holy Spirit. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son. Notice no word does it say that she that, that Joseph got his firstborn son. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him, in, wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. God has a people in every kindred, nation, and tongue. For unto you is born this day. Remember what Isaiah said? Unto us a child is born. Unto you, the, the angel came to them and said, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. This is how you're going to know. How many times in your life has God given you a sign? It, again, it might not necessarily have been a physical thing. Sometimes it is. <clears throat> but he gives you an assurance. 
in your heart in one way or another that this is true, that this is his word. This shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were going away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Isn't it wonderful, child of God, whenever the Spirit of God comes and in His glory bids you to see and to understand His truth and it serves your heart that you desire to go and see this thing that the Lord has promised unto you. And they came with haste. I'm running out of time. And they came with haste. Child of God, when the Spirit of God moves you, you're going to get in a hurry. When God begins to reveal His Son in you, you're going to get in a hurry. You're going to have a desire and a zeal kindled in you that won't be held back and won't be denied. One writer described it as a fire shut up in your bones. I would to God that we might see his people more and more with a fire shut up in their bones. With a zeal for God's house for God's people, for the truth of Jesus Christ, that we would with joy and gladness come and see this thing that the Lord has done. Because it's given unto us, unto us, the child is born, unto us, a son, is given. May the government, may we recognize always, and I'm not telling you that we're not going to be concerned about our country. We can't help but be concerned about our country. But you just remember this. Your government is upon his shoulders. And there's no end to the increase of his government and of his peace. May God bless and keep you is my prayer. May you have a blessed holiday season, however you expect to spend it. May you be safe and well. And may you give God the praise, the honor, and the glory for it all.